What's up, everybody? This is the Ike's Inspirations Podcast, and today I have a great guest named Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy has an interesting background as a tech entrepreneur and a sickle cell warrior, and I w- we are, I'm glad that he's able to come on this podcast. Jimmy, can you please do us a favor of introducing yourself and giving a brief summary of your life story? Absolutely. Well, um, brief summary of my life story. I don't think we have enough time, but I'll try to keep it short. Uh, my name is Jimmy Olahe. I was one of the first patients, not the first, but you know, a, a few dozen to fortunately uh, go through a CRISPR clinical trial that really transformed my life. You know, I was born with sickle cell disease here in the U.S., but I eventually moved back to Nigeria to live with my parents. And eventually I came back to the U.S. and, uh, you know, the disease really took over my life. Uh, life got really difficult. Uh, living here, going to school, working, you know, trying to build my business. It was, it was difficult doing all of that with sickle cell. And in, I believe, 2020, 2019, actually, I got an article about a woman called Victoria Gray, who was the first person to go through gene therapy for sickle cell disease. And uh, fortunately for me, I was able to qualify for that trial. And that literally uh, has changed my life. Yeah, man, and I'm I'm glad that you're here to share your story with uh, sickle cell. Because uh, for those who don't know, I, I too also have sickle cell. So to hear your story about CRISPR and how it's it's helped you is it's, it's extremely inspiring. You know, I, I have I have a lot of questions for you, Jimmy. And my first question is, in regards to your entrepreneurial background, can you speak more towards that and how you were able to navigate the tech industry and find success in it? Absolutely. So I actually was born, my, my parents were entrepreneurs as well. Um, so I got really, really lucky. I, my mom had boutiques in Lagos. She had multiple boutiques in, in Lagos, Nigeria. My dad was the CEO of a publicly traded company. So wow. I, you know, it was so easy for me to get into entrepreneurship because that's what I grew up watching, uh, seeing my mom and dad run their businesses. And when the disease really started to take a stranglehold of my life, my wife and I realized that the only way we were going to be able to keep a roof over our head was for me to start working for myself because I couldn't mm-hmm. hold any employment because I'll constantly get sick, call out, my employers will get pissed, which now that I'm employing myself, I completely understand what obviously I don't do that. But um, you know, people just be just really hard to hold a job while you have sickle cell disease. And uh, my wife and I, we decided that, listen, it's time for you to kind of chart your own path. And that's when I started looking at ideas into how I can make money and not rely on employment for money. One of the first things that came to mind was starting a tech business because I, I was always into coding. I remember in coding classes, I used to teach my teachers how to code and they used to get so pissed at me. So I was like, you know what? I probably have an edge uh, in, with technology. So that, and it's easy too. You could do it from your computer, uh, which was fantastic for someone that had a vascular necrosis, pain all the time. I didn't want to leave the house. So that's why I started with tech. Um, yeah, it, it was difficult uh, navigating navigating the tech industry while I had full blown sickle cell disease. I used to live in New Jersey at the time. And I remember a lot of networking events that I had scheduled to attend. Many of them I had to call out for or not make it. And I, uh-huh. I got the sense that people always thought I was like flaky, not knowing in the background what was going on was I was fighting this incredible challenging disease. But uh-huh. still, um, I didn't let it deter me at all. I kept on pushing, kept on fighting, uh, kept on to the best of my ability building these businesses that I, all the business that I wanted to be. One of the first one was an online uh, freelancing marketplace because uh, at the time I wanted to be a writer. That was another avenue for me to, to make money was to write online. Uh, this was when blogs became popular. Yeah. So I was blogging for people. I had my own blog, and but it was difficult to get a good job as a freelance writer. Because back then, this is when a lot of people relied on uh, marketplaces, freelance marketplaces. Uh, most of the writers and most of the talent you could get were based in India. So for a writer with talent here in the U.S., 
there was this race to the bottom mentality where everyone wants to pay the cheapest writer to write on their blog for them. And that just couldn't work for me. I couldn't make a living competing with writers overseas because their cost of living is so much lower compared to mine here in the U.S. My cost of living is through the roof living here in the U.S. compared to theirs. So I decided to fix that issue by creating a marketplace for writers here in the U.S. And that's how I started my um, first internet venture, bagarider.com. And it did well. It got uh, it ended up it ended up getting uh, acquired uh, within the first year of selling it. I got offers from uh, a company called Freelancer.com, which is one of the biggest freelancer sites that is right now. And back then too, I didn't sell it to them. I sold it to another company. But um, that's how I, I, I got started when I when I sold that business. When that business got acquired, I uh, got you know I cut the ball. I'm like, oh, I want to do another one, you know, and. After that one, before I got into my next thing, I started, you know, helping other entrepreneurs build websites. I started like a, a digital agency where we built websites and built technology for all the people looking to build businesses at a scale bit. Yeah, man, that, man, that, that you said a handful, and I'm glad that you were able to share your story. It's funny that you um, said that you started entrepreneurship and you have Nigerian parents. You know, I'm also Nigerian. And it's just, you know, you say you're lucky. I would definitely say you're very lucky because I'm sure you heard of like the typical Nigerian parents. They do not like, they're not a fan of entrepreneurship at all. It's so like, it's either you're a doctor or you're an engineer or like, you know, like that's it. Yeah. So anytime yeah. I talk, talk to my parents about entrepreneur endeavors, you know, it doesn't usually get the most love because of the uncertainty. So to have that from your parents who are a lot more supportive and, you know, that's, that is very interesting and unique and I'm, I'm glad you were able yeah. to do that and I, I'm I and I empathize with your struggle of, of balancing uh sickle cell with having businesses that that's just an um, interesting perspective to me that um you kind of instead of thinking like oh I can't work for anyone I gotta work for myself because I have sickle cell I, I never made that yeah. um that correlation but it makes a lot of sense though yeah yeah sorry I'm sweating bullets over here I mean one of my businesses that it, it's in Georgia right now, and it's extremely hot. So excuse the sweat, everyone. Dude, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in Atlanta too. About, I mean, are you oh, Atlanta? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm in the Atlanta suburbs. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome, man. So my next question for you, man, um, is in your opinion, what was the most pivotal decision you made in your life? Um, for me, the most pivotal decision I made. I'll, I'll give you two. Sure. Um, I think the first one is probably the person I married. Um, mm-hmm. Extremely fortunate with my life partner, my wife, um, who has guided me through um, this challenging disease. And for actually, she's been a caregiver. Um, if, if I'm quite honest, for most of my life, she's been my caregiver. After my parents, of course, uh, she's been my caregiver. And the second most pivotal decision was uh, definitely saying yes to trying out CRISPR. In regards to Chris, Chris Burr, because I, I would love to learn more about that, Jimmy, uh, how did you even get in touch with CRISPR? And can you explain to the audience what CRISPR is? Absolutely. Um, so how I got into it is at one point in my life, my life was really, really poor. Um, my quality of life, I should say. Lots and lots of challenges living with the disease and near-death experiences. And my parents were just like, you got to, you know, we got to figure out something. We got to try bone marrow transplant, anything, stem cell transplant. You got to do something to save your life, basically. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that came up was bone marrow transplant, which uh, I wasn't really interested in just because of the recovery time, the risk of uh, graft versus host disease. And I didn't have a match. None of my sisters mm-hmm. were a match. I had three sisters and none of them were a match. Uh, and then... I started doing research on gene therapy, gene editing, and I put a Google alert on. I saw that gene therapy was being used to do genetic things. Uh, you know, I heard the story of a doctor in, in, in the Far East that had used, uh, used gene therapy to do some cosmetic things. So if you can use gene therapy for cosmetic things, you can use gene therapy for hereditary diseases. And 
I put a Google alert on if anything ever comes together that's gene therapy and sickle cell disease, I got an email. And then I got an email, I think probably two years later after that research. I was really expecting it to be something in the in the future, like that eight. Uh, and to be quite honest, I had actually done that research just to kind of pacify my parents so they yeah. leave me alone. And I'm like, all right, I've done it. You know, one day there's going to be something called gene therapy and maybe it'll save my life. Well, and unbeknownst to me, this is something that's that actually live, real, using me to cure cancer already, but not sickle cell disease wow. yet. And mm-hmm. two years later, I got that article in my inbox and it was about the woman I talked about, Victoria Gray. Uh, I read the article. As soon as I read the article, they had the contact information of the a uh, hospital that was running the clinical trial. I called them back and um, I mean, I, I left a message for them and they called me back and and all, all I, I qualified basically. So in regards to that, um, as you were saying, yeah, man, can you do us a favor and just explain to the audience what CRISPR actually is? Um, to my understanding, it's like a procedure that essentially increases your hemoglobin up levels right and um, for me um i've been pretty blessed with sickle cell in, ter- in regards to my health because fortunately for me hydroxyurea has, has been an effective medication i know that's not the case for everyone i believe it's the same with you it hasn't been effective um but hydroxyurea has drastically increased my hemoglobin f levels which has pretty yeah. much used the amount of sickle cells in my body yeah. uh yeah. you know w- can you describe that process for you and what CRISPR is like and how it can possibly be to help other people with their hemoglobin F levels. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what CRISPR is, <clears throat> actually, CRISPR doesn't actually increase your hemoglobin level. CRISPR does not do that. What CRISPR does is a technique that they use to find your DNA, a specific allele in the DNA. It's CRISPR. It's almost like the scissors where you can cut and paste. You know, you can... You know that cut and paste function on a yeah. Word document? That's exactly what CRISPR is within our DNA. So CRISPR can go in there, it can find a DNA, you can cut it, and then the because of its DNA, DNA, you can put a new DNA or a new allele in there and it starts to grow. That's what CRISPR actually is. It's a medical scissors, I like to call it, where you go in, you find something, you remove it, and then you paste something else in there. So that's what CRISPR does. Well, you're right. So, uh, uh, what the version of transplant I got is they use CRISPR to go inside of me to find the DNA uh, that's called um, um, they to find a DNA that's called BCL11A. What BCL11A does is when you are born, it turns off. Actually, sorry, when you're born, it turns on. And then when you when it turns on, you start producing hemoglobin F when you're born. Mm. Because we all produce hemoglobin F while we're in utero, while we're mm. in a mother's womb. But then mm. as soon as you're born, BCL eleven A, it turns on and then you start producing fetal hemoglobin. So what mm. they use CRISPR to do is they use CRISPR to go find BCL eleven A and then they now turned it off. So now I'm producing hemoglobin F as I found in my mother's womb again. So because I now have hemoglobin F flowing through my body, I'm not feeling the effects of sickle cell like you through hydroxyurea. That's yeah. what um, the file I went for. So with yeah. CRISPR, you can actually go to CRISPR and actually find the sickle cell DNA. The sickle cell DNA, I don't know what that one's called. You can find the allele that's responsible for causing sickle cell and you can actually remove it. You know, and now oh, start wow. producing. Yeah, they, I know there 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 are biotech companies that are working on that right now, where you can actually oh, wow. cure the mutation of sickle cell with CRISPR Cas9, Cas12, whichever variation. Wow, man, this is incredible, incredible information. This is all new to me, uh, and I have a, I have a sickle cell channel uh, dedicated to advocating for people with sickle cell, and this has been incredibly like interesting you know because i did make a video on this and one of the things about it is although it sounds like it's very effective in helping people 
the accessibility seems to be an issue. And when I was researching it, it's like it costs millions of dollars to actually yeah. like do this. And I'm so I'm like, this is great news, but it's like how, people can actually use this. Well, most people can't. So I'm kind of, you know, my question to you was, how were you able to get access to this? Because I'm sure a lot of people who are listening would like to learn for themselves to perhaps, you know, put themselves in yeah. position to actually get these therapies. 100%, 100%. It is uh, not accessible right now, even though it's approved and technically on the market. It, it is on the market. If you have $2.5 million in your bank account, you can go to Vertex, pay them, and they'll give you crystal therapy. They'll, they'll recommend you, uh, you know, where to a, a clinical site that will do the therapy where you need $2.5 million, you know. Um, like you said, what you, uh, on the um, outset of this call, I'm being very, very lucky and very, very fortunate. That was the same thing with CRISPR. Um, I got um, in a clinical trial that made it free for me. I, I didn't have to pay a cent um, for the actual transplant. Uh, so extremely lucky uh, there again. Um, but you're 100% right that right now it is quite inaccessible. Um, and everyone knows that. The, the biotech companies know that. And right now they're working with Medicaid, Medicare, CMS, um, other payees and healthcare providers uh, to figure out ways to make sure that the therapy is accessible if someone needs it. You know, one thing that we have to talk about when we talk about is uh, one-time treatments. They're expensive for a reason. You know, it, 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 I, going through it, I saw why it was expensive. This is expensive. Um, you have to do collections. You have to do... Um, multiple blood transfusions, chemo, transplant. They have to ship yourself to a manufacturing center where they manufacture it, where they edit it. You know, it's, that's expensive stuff. Someone has to pay for that. So that's why that's why it's expensive. At the same time, there's a way to figure out how to make sure that it is accessible for the common man, you know, for the guy on Main Street who, who needs it. Also, it's also a treatment for the worst sick people amongst us that have sickle cell disease. So for example, I don't think CRISPR is a, is a good candidate for you because like you said, you're, you're doing quite well with hydroxyurea. So that severely decreases the patient population. You know, it's documented right now that, that about 100,000 people suffer from sickle cell disease in America. Yeah. But I'm not sure what the exact number is, but I'm sure it's way less than that. People that have severe sickle cell disease like I did, it's yeah. probably between the range of 20,000 to 50,000. So that also decreases the population that will need something like CRISPR. And then finally, the, where I think CRISPR will have the most impactful application is in sub-Saharan Africa, where we're from, uh, Nigeria. I'm sure I have cousins. Literally, I was talking to my cousin uh, the other day that I saw you on blah, 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 on TV. We're talking about this CRISPR thing. When is it coming here? You know, and I had literally yeah. no answer for him. Like, I have no clue when it's coming coming to Africa. So I, that's where most of the work needs to be done in making sure that this disease is cured sure. at the root cause in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa where it yeah. needs to be accessible. For now, the mm-hmm. pricing is not going to make it happen. But what we have to do is we have to support these regions in other ways or, or mm-hmm. until we can figure out a way to get this um, one-time treatment accessible. So support in other ways, newborn screening, blood transfusions, donations, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, for sure, man, th- this is incredibly true. I, mean, I have so many questions. My first question, and I want to make this clear because I-, I think it was marketed one way, but is this a cure, yes or no? Well, that's a tough question <laughs> because for me, I still have sickle cell disease because I still have hemoglobin S flowing through me. Yeah. So, so it is not a definition. It, I can't say it's secure because I still yeah. have sickle cell disease, but I don't feel it at all. You know, I don't feel like I have sickle cell disease at all. So, yeah, that's a tough question. And particularly because they did not cure the sickle cell mutation. That's why I'm creating sickle cells. So it's hard to call it a cure, even though that I do feel cured. One word that we've been using is like a functional cure or, <laughs> you know, there, there's yeah. several ways you, you can try and word it, but by definition, it's not a cure. 
Yeah. And th- th- thank you for clarifying that because I-, I-, I just felt like a lot of people marketed it as a cure to kind of, you know, make it get more clicks and whatnot, which I, I completely understand, though. Like the most important thing is that you don't get any crises, you know. Uh, so have you had any exactly. crises, Jimmy, or since you've gotten this uh, treatment? And how long have you had this treatment for? Like, when did you get this treatment? Because uh, yeah. this is also provides some context for people. Absolutely. I had the uh, the treatment room four years ago, uh, and I have not experienced any crisis since then. Um, my lifestyle has completely changed um, in terms of what I can do compared to what I can't do. Uh, so one of the things you said at the um, outset of this call is that I'm a tech entrepreneur. Now I'm no longer a tech entrepreneur. Now I'm buying physical brick and mortar businesses, which was out of my reach before because there was no way I could live with the stress of managing retail businesses. Mm-hmm. Now I'm able to do that. You know, I'm able to run from one building to another. I have now I'm buying businesses on Main Street. So I'm I'm hopping around on my different businesses and sweating mm-hmm. like a penny like you see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm able to handle all of that. You know, before uh, uh, my I had a I didn't still have an e-commerce and you know I'll ship I'll, I'll go in the warehouse and I'll help my team ship stuff out and two days later I can't get out of there. That's mm-hmm. how bad it was. You know what I mean? Every time we would ship something, particularly in December Q4, when it was a busy season for shipping and I'm and you need extra hands because it's Q4, you need extra hands. Every time really? I go in and I help the team out ship. It'll literally take me two or three days to recover. I would literally be in bed for three days. And now I'm doing that and more. And I, I don't need any recovery time. Bro, that is incredible, man. Like this is this is so like incredible. And I'm I'm so glad that you are sharing this because I think the biggest thing that people with sickle cell need is as actual hope. And you know, hearing this from you is giving me a lot of hope. Just, not just for myself, but just for people with sickle cell and everyone going through it. Because every time, you know, we hear about different medications and different therapies coming out, but it's either it's too expensive or they make it, it's they market it as something a lot more effective than it actually is. But to actually hear something that's a one-time treatment that can actually long-term help you now, you said you've never had any crises. That is, that is incredible, man. You know, when you went into this, uh, when you went into CRISPR, what was your initial reaction? Were you not scared? Uh, you know, because this has been a very new, a very new thing, and it, it was and 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 there was not much data on it. Uh, what gave you the confidence or the faith to want to pursue this endeavor and and feel good about it? Yeah, um, it was actually desperation. Um, at the time, my wife was pregnant. Um, eight months with our first son and just battling the disease for 35 years. I knew it was going to take me away from the father I've always wanted to be. So when I got that email, uh, that Google alert that we talked about when, when it came in, I, I had no doubt in my mind that if I qualified, this is something I wanted to do. Despite the fact that I had read all the symptoms and I read that, um, you know, you could is something called off-target editing, where they could accidentally edit the wrong cell mm-hmm. and cause something else. Um, because of all the chemotherapy and all of that, there's chances of getting leukemia. None of that um, made me afraid. I wasn't scared of any of that. I just wanted to do it because I, I having the disease, I knew one, <laughs> it's going to be difficult for my wife to take care of me and take care of her son. You know, and me, I just wanted to be there for my son. God forbid that, you know, knock on wood, I didn't want to, um, you know, perish early because that had uh, I'd come so close to losing my life so many times. I didn't want to put that burden on my child, my wife and all of that. So I was like, yo, I'm going to try this out. I don't care how hard it's going to be. I don't care if it doesn't work. It is, it is actually riskier if I have this opportunity and don't need mm-hmm. it than to do nothing. Yes. Yes. Okay, so pretty much, you, because I, I understand what that pain is like. Uh, I, I used to be in and out of the hospital all the time as a kid until I took hydroxyurea. And, dude, it's the worst pain. I, I had I had a few near-death experiences as well. So, you know, when you go through something that traumatic and that painful, you want nothing to do with it. And so I, I, I hear you, man. And, 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 and that that's just incredible. I... um. 
I have so many questions for you in terms of like, you know, movement and sports. You know, you said you've been able to go like do move and your businesses like you, you feel like like your stamina is up to speed and everything. You don't feel uh, like any type of energy relapse because, you know, when you were when you had sickle cell, one of the main one of the main symptoms, at least for me and for uh, most people is fatigue you know like you're just always tired you don't have the energy to do things uh, once you got this crisper do you feel like do you still have suffer from fatigue or do you can you can just you have a lot more energy throughout your day i have too much energy now actually <laughs> oh, um, wow. yeah I, I think it's also my lifestyle but excuse me um i find that i find it hard to stay in bed you know, as soon as it's like mm. 4 a.m., my body's up. Yeah. Before I used to stay in bed all day, I was considered bedridden. You know, I had this laptop desk that my wife brought for me so I could work. I'd work from bed. She'd wake up in the morning at like 6, 6.30, make me breakfast, put food on my bedside, put the lunch on my bedside, and... She'll go to work in the morning at seven and she'll wow. come back at like six and I'm still literally in bed. Maybe the only time I would get up is to use the bathroom or something. No. And now I, I don't know if it's because of that and it's definitely maybe slightly because of it. Now as soon as it's 4 a.m. I'm out of bed and I'm out of the house. I'm either doing something with the kids or at work and I'm not in bed till about 9, 9, 30, 10. And some, there's some days when I'm not in bed. If it's if a hard work week, I'm not in bed till like 11, 12. And I'll still wake oh. up at four in the morning. You know, I'm not fatigued. Like I said, it feels like I have too much in it. And also at the same time, I also maintain a really physical lifestyle in terms of um, working out. Uh, I, I, because now I have control of my health, I want to make sure that my health is always on top because for so long I didn't have control of it. Now that I have control of it, I'm making sure I'm at peak performance. So I do, I eat right. I'm working out. Uh, and, and yeah, no shortness of before I couldn't climb a flight of stairs without stopping yeah. to catch my breath. And now I'm about to go climb Mount Kilimanjaro, you know? Wow, man, dude, this is such an inspirational story. Uh, I, I'm I'm just it's so it's so it's so it's so great to hear this. I think this gives a lot of people hope. You know, psychologically, I feel like one of the things about sickle cell disease that often goes I don't feel like spoken about enough is yes, the pain is terrible. It's incredibly terrible. But I feel like psychologically, that's probably one of the hardest things to deal with. You know, I, I oftentimes I read that uh, four, sickle cell warriors are four times more likely to be depressed than the average person because there are so many traumas you're questioning yourself why me god why why do i feel like this why do i have to go through this pain uh you know my question to you is uh like psychologically how has your identity shift or how has your perception about yourself changed now that you have that you are much healthier and you don't get any crises yeah yeah you know the mental health side of things is huge you know for most warriors, um, and you're right, it's often underlooked. I, I think it's because it's, with sickle cell, it just feels like hopelessness. Yeah. You know, there's no future. You, you just don't see you, yourself doing anything that you always wanted to do. Your dreams, it, none of it matters. So you're hopeless. And it, and like you said, the PTSD that comes with the disease is that from your experiences of going through such traumatic pain i mean the pain is it's sometimes indescribable i wish pe i wish there was a way we could make people feel the yeah. pain you know yeah. like you don't understand this is it, it that pain well, literally me, changes you like woman um woman with sickle cell disease say is worse than um barren birth that that's for women I, I i'm not a woman so i can't experience that but yeah. a lot of women say it's worse than barren birth you know yeah yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's really bad. Um, yes, because now I'm able to always do what I wanted to do. Um, my mental health is much more improved. Um, thankfully, I, you know, my mental health wasn't great as well. At one point in my life, I was on Prozac. Uh, you know, just to to yeah. Prozac or Lexapro, I can't even remember to to help me deal with the struggles of um, living with the disease. 
and and now I don't eat that anymore. Um, this was a long, long time ago, even before the trial. But now I don't need that it, because I have control. And like you said, the, the thing that you said is your identity. One of the things I've realized about the disease is it actually changes who you're supposed to be. Uh, sure, it, it 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 you get it. It makes you rewire your personality, and yes. you kind of have to adjust to a lifestyle that is um, conducive to your sickle cell disease. Yeah. So, for so long, I always thought I was a shy, introspective gamer. And more I'm realizing I'm not as shy as I thought I was. I'm actually yes. more outgoing and bubbly and I want to be outside uh, and physical. I don't think I didn't even realize that, I'm, you know, if I didn't have sickle cell disease, I'm prob- I would have probably been an athlete because I have an athlete's mind there. And I didn't know that about myself until I had overcome the disease. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, it, it's so interesting that you said that. I mean, I can go on and on, but that's one of the underrated things about sickle cell is that it changes your perception of who you are. And then you kind of have to adapt to doing a lot of things, you know, just like you, a lot of businesses and activities that I do are conducted to being online because it's conducive to me. You know, as a pharmacist, I work from home. People don't even know you can work from home as a pharmacist, but it's optimal for my sickle cell. So I, I like to do that. Um, but yeah, it's interesting because, you know, I think sickle cell, um, growing up as a kid, you're going through these traumatic experiences. And so you're probably smaller than the average person. You're probably skinnier. You're probably just not able to attend a lot of these uh, social gatherings that you, that, that, you know, you probably missed out on a lot of stuff. Like you said, you missed out on a lot of networking events. And as a result, you know, you probably start to think that you are, you're timid or you may not be as confident mm-hmm. as, 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 as you feel like you should be when interacting with people. I know when I was young, I used to identify myself as someone who was timid or shy. And no longer now do I do that, but I know it was a result of my sickle cell disease, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. It's encouraging to see so many people going through the same thing. You know, we like yeah. to see that, you know, every sickle cell patient is the same. When I mean, it's not the same. We're not like all monolithic, but at the same time, it's weird that you're talking to a few sickle cell patients this week. We we go through the same experiences to hear that, you know, you had that same experience with being introverted. And yeah, because I'm like, am I really introverted? And now that, you know, I'm not dealing with sickle cell like I used to, I realize I know you're not introverted at all. You just have to be introverted to, to yeah. you know, as a way to, to, to self preservation. Yeah, which is very interesting, man. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, my, my last question for you, man, is, uh, you know, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are interested in this treatment. And I know it's it's costly and it's not accessible, but you know how it feels like to, to have sickle cell and go through that pain. And I'm sure there's, watching, there's somebody watching who's, who's going through it, who's desperate, and they're looking for an ounce of hope, just like you were before this treatment. What would you say is the best way of getting access to this treatment? Stay alive. Don't die. You know, don't give up. Just keep holding on. It's it's gonna be accessible. I I was gonna say very soon. I don't think that's the case. It's gonna be accessible eventually. Um, this is something that, like I said, the companies that manufacture these therapies are well aware of, and they're well aware of the community that needs the treatment. They they know that that that, that this is an issue that needs to be fixed. So, my advice is: yeah, it's here. Um, from my experience, it's definitely working, even though we can't use the big C word cure, it for lack of a better term is, you know, it is the way I feel. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if, just don't give up. Um, do what you need to do to get to the next phase is when people ask me that question, like just get to tomorrow. And then when you make it tomorrow, get to the other day, just keep going, keep chugging along on anything you need to do to make sure that you're not six feet under when this treatment becomes accessible, do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Thank you so anything. much. Yeah, man. No, thank you so much for for sharing that. I'm sure it's going to resonate with a few sick or so worries because I, I, under my channel, I get comments all the time with how debilitating the pain. You already know how it feels like, man, and, and just how much 
the biggest the biggest sense I get from those comments and just other people when I speak to it's it's hopelessness. It's like, man, like how the hell am I gonna get out of this pain? Like nothing works. I take hydroxyurea, that doesn't work. I take oxbrita, that doesn't work. I drink a lot of water, that doesn't work. And it's like, and I feel bad because I I, I have this channel and I, and I try to give as much solutions as possible. But at the end of the day, if you're doing everything that that you can and it's not working, like it, it's hard to to not have faith and, and to continue to have faith. So. I'm so grateful for your presence and for you sharing this story. I think it's going to help a lot of people. And in regards to the people who are interested in speaking to you or learning more about your story, how can people reach out to you, Jimmy? Um, you can reach out to me. Um, these days, I'm not as active on social media as I used to. You can reach out to me on uh, email. My email is Jimmy, K I M I, at geek supply, G E E K S U. Pply.co.co. That's him. Yeah, Jimmy. Thank you so much for sharing your um your voice with us and sharing your story. Uh, and I, and it's been it's really hopeful for me for like for the future of Sickle Cell and what what could be because it's not even just your CRISPR. It just seems like there's so many other options, or alternative options that are are on the rise. And there's so many different medications and so many different treatment options. And just the overall amount of awareness that's coming towards sickle cell is, is incredible. Yes, it is. It's, there's a lot of hope now, you know. Yeah. So um, I know it's not it's not built and down yet, but eventually it's going to say, yeah, keep off the good work. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you uh, invited me on. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, you have a great one, man. Likewise. Take care, mate. Thank you.